professor at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and he obtained his PhD degree from University of Michigan, and then he took the Hubble Fellowship in Princeton. And last year, he just won the Sloan Fellowship. Zhao Huan is a great expert in the astrophysical fluid dynamics, and he's interested in the interaction between planets and disks. And today, he will tell us about the exciting results on the uh, probing the young planets in protoplanetary disks. Yeah, thank you, Gongjie. Uh, maybe I should stand here. Um, oh, wherever you would like to stand, I'll move. <laughs> so uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, although I've been to CFA before, but most uh, I see it within the SMA group, but it's my first time at IPC. So, um, so today I'll talk about probing young planets in protoplanetary disks. Um, how the theory confronts observations. And this work is collaborating with a lot of people, including my longtime collaborator, Robin Thomas. Uh, when he was still a graduate student at Princeton, and now he's moving to Victoria, starting a faculty position. And part of the work is also collaborating with JMB, a graduate student of, of Lee Hartman, but worked with me on some of these uh, subjects that I'll talk about. Uh, and now he's moving to uh, Carnegie Institution of Science um, to start as a grouping postdoc fellow. And part of the work is collaborate with uh, Princeton, uh, people at Princeton. So, um, so, so we know young stars form in the molecular core cores. When the core collapses, you form a photo star in the center, and we are left with an envelope and with a disk. And eventually, the disk goes away, and we are left with a protoplanetary disk. And planets could form in this protoplanetary disks. And eventually, this protoplanetary disk goes away, and we are left with the planetary systems, exoter planetary systems. So, my talk will be about the protoplanetary disk stage, and this particular stage where when the young planets could form in this disk. So, protoplanetary disks are very important due to many, many reasons. The first reason is important for both star and planet formation. So star appears to the central star to build the central star, and planets forming these disks, particle could set up, dust particle could settle in the disk, they could grow, and eventually form planetesimals and form planets. So it's the birthplace for both star and planets. And the protoplanet disk is important also because it's related with meteorotics. All the conduits and CIs in meteorites, they all form in the protoplanet disks. So in order to study how these things to reveal the initial condition for our solar system, we need to know how they form and where they form, how they transport it uh, in the disk. And protoplanetism is also important because the, the star has very strong UV field and X-ray field, so there's a rich chemistry in the disks. So we could form organic molecules in the disks, and so this is important even for life or our existence. So all the poor planet disk is very important, but we really know little about it from the theoretical point of view. First, we don't know even the disk accretes, uh, even the disk turbulence where it's a laminar. So theoretical work suggests that very inner part of the disk, the disk temperature is high enough, so it's sufficiently ionized, so the material will couple with the magnetic field and trigger magnetic rotation instability. So the disk could be turbulent and transgranular momentum at very inner part of the disk. But beyond point 0.1 AU, the disk has very low ionization. So it could, um, the disk may not be turbulent, and maybe we need to rely on large-scale magnetic field to generate um, large-scale disk wind to carry any moment away uh, to its true operation. So Xuanin did a lot of, Xuanin Bai did a lot of work on this disk wind um, scenario. So for this gaseous disk, we know it, but we really don't know if the disk is very turbulent or if it's very lambda. Not to mention, we know even less about how the planet could um, climb the ladder, a particle could climb the ladder from micron size all the way to thousands of kilometers, 13 order magnitude jump within one million year of lifetime. So there are a lot of theories on um, particle particle sticking or particle settled to the mid plane and the various instability could operate, eventually, gravity takes over from planets. But these are all theories, so we have a lot of theories on planet formation. So what we really need is a real system to test this theory. So for thousands of years, we only have one system, um, solar system to study. But now, thanks to largely thanks to Kepler, we have more than 3,000 planetary systems. 
However, all these systems are billions of years old. So a lot of things could happen after the planet of Earth and at and the planet at this stage. So what we really need to study or to unveil the planet formation process is study the young planetary system. So we need to look at systems which are only billions of years old instead of like these systems um, of millions of years instead of these systems which are billions of years old. So we need to look at uh, star forming regions. And now is a great time where is a golden era to study planet formation and largely thanks to AMA we have, have, um, we have spatial resolution yeah, much better. Thanks. So we have what we could read. We have a spatial resolution which goes to several AU scale. So we could uh, start start to look at all the features in protoplanet disks and how they relate with our solar system. So this is the first time we could really start to look at protoplanet disks at the scale of the planet construction zone. So this is remarkable, and it's a golden time to study planet formation. So uh, unfortunately. AMA brought more puzzles than the question is solved. Okay. So here I will show a gallery of uh, images from AMA and also from ground-based telescopes. Um, the ground-based telescopes, uh, most of them come from VOT or, um, uh, or Gemini. They're showing on this side, and the radio AMA is showing on this side. So first, we have seen these axisymmetric features in the disks. Um, and near infrared and radio, they have rings and gaps. Yeah, very nice. Uh, sounds like seems like a planet in the disk, and I call it M equals zero mode in the disk. And then we have these things which have large scale disk symmetry. So especially for this particular source, it's very strange. All the dust emission just come from one side of the disk, not from the other side. The signal to noise ratio is extremely high here, it's more than one hundred. But here on this side, the dust emission is undetected. So the disk is highly oxided. And the same uh, case for this source. So this is M equal 1 mode. And then we have M equal 2 mode, the two spiral arms, nicely symmetric. So AMA have reviewed these structures with all the possible configurations, M equal 0, M equal 1, M equal 2. So in future, maybe we have more observations. We have M equal 3 and 4 or 5. So we have all the possibilities. So it seems we have a variety of these features. Then the question is, what causes these features? And in this talk, I'll talk about how about um, we have planets and how the planet ring could explain these features. But if these features are indeed induced by planets, then where are the planets? And we need to find the planet to say this are indeed um, due to planets. So this is my talk outline. First, I talk about how the planet to explain the gaps, a symmetric structure, and spirals. And then I'll focus on the spiral structure and go into depth. Uh, talk about a bit theory on the spiral density waves. And then I'll talk about how we can find these young planets. And I think um, a good way to do it is looking for certain planetary disks. These, these disks are around the tiny planets. And I think this would be a very key, the key to find young planets in these. And finally, I'll present some of the global protoplanet disk simulations, 3D MHD uh, simulations, um, to show how, uh, how we would do so this is a simulation with a, um, with a disks, invasive disks, and now I'll show a planet in the disks. And the planet will perturb the disks inside spiral density wave. And when the planet mass is small, we will see the spiral arm, but when the planet mass increases, the spiral arm will become spiral short. Then they will transport angular momentum between the wave and the background disk and start open gaps. And the gap edge normally uh, is unstable Rossby wave instability, or some instability, and the form vortices. And these vortices will merge and eventually become one giant vortex. So in this particular simulation, you see we have seen all these features in the disks, the gap, the disk symmetry, and the spirals. So the planet is capable to generate all of these uh, features. So it all depends on the mass you put in the the mass of a planet you put in the disk. So previously, in order to explain entry of AO tau, we put a small planet in the disk. In this case, the planet will open a gap without introducing large-scale structure. To explain some of the large-scale structures, we put a massive planet. And then we run these simulations, and then we post-process these simulations with Monte Carlo radio transfer image, and then we could get these synthetic AMA images. 
and then we could compare with the real AMA observations. So it seems that the planetary scenario could explain these observations uh, very well just by using different planet uh, masses, uh, for different planets uh, in the thesis. And these simulations also have predictions. For example, um, the sim this particular simulation predicts that if we have higher resolution, then the, this structure will look narrower and narrower. Obviously, it's unresolved. So these things can be tested um, by future observations. Uh, however, in this particular talk, I'll most focus on these spiral structures in the disks. Uh, because these uh, gaps and the symmetric structure is really easy to explain. And the spirals is hard to explain. So the reason is the spiral density wave in the protoplanetary disks is basically a sound wave in the disk. You could imagine the planet emits a sound uh, in the disk. So the signal will propagate in a radio direction at a sound speed, and then the signal will be sheared in the azimuthal direction due to the gap average shear. So normally the tangent direction of the azimuthal direction and uh, the tangent direction of the spiral arm and the azimuthal direction, the beta, is called the pitch angle. The tangent of this pitch angle is basically the ratio between the radio signal speed, sound speed, over the azimuthal speed, which is the shear speed. So you can see the pitch angle or the openness of a spiral arm is directly related with the disk temperature. If we increase the temperature, for example, in this simulation here, then the spiral arm opens up more. So in this linear theory, we could use the openness of a spiral arm to test, the, to estimate the disk temperature. Your discussion is two-dimensional so far. Yes. So yeah. you're averaging over the scale. Yes. Uh, is there a three-dimensional effect? Yeah, I'll talk about that. The, it has a, a strong three-dimensional effect. Yeah. So this is pure 2D uh, uh, this is wave theory. Uh, so when, when people try to apply that theory to this particular source, MWC758, uh, they have great difficulty to explain these spiral arms. That's because if they plan, put a planet at the inner disks, in order to fit the pitch angle, they need to use a 300 Kelvin temperature at 50. And all the CO lines suggest the temperature at 50 is 50 Kelvin. And all the Monte Carlo radio transfer calculation, this thermal scar calculation suggests the temperature is around 50, not as high as 300 Kelvin. And the second problem is in order to explain these two spiral arm, uh, you need to have kind of have a two planets at opposite sides of the disks, which kind of sounds like a coincidence. You have a planet uh, co-orbit uh, with each other to explain these two spiral arm. And another difficulty is uh, these planet-induced spiral arms normally are very weak. If you do 2D simulation and path the disk from 2D to 3D, assuming vertical hydrostatic equilibrium, and putting the <coughs> video transfer, you won't see the spiral arm. So there are two difficulties, and I think these two difficulties have their own problem. And the first prob difficult problem is here they try to use a linear theory to explain this spiral arm, although the spiral arm could highly nonlinear. And the third, that's for the, this point, um, we need to know the near infrared observations only probe the disk surface structure, the surface ripples, not the mid plane. And we know the shocks have three D structure uh, from the linear calculation, very smooth, uh, uh, very smooth. So in order to um, study this problem, we use the new code um, was developed at Princeton, Athena++ code. So it's a rewritten for the original Athena code, but it's designed for global simulations. It's three times faster than Athena and has very flexible grid structure, um, even with mesh refinement. So this project was done when at the earlier development stage of this code, and we think this is a good problem, a test problem, planning is actually a good pe test problem for this new code. So we just drove a planet in the disk to study the linear theory. And we find that when the planet mass is small, indeed the spiral arm structure could trace the linear curve very well. So the dotted curve is the, from the linear theory. This is from simulation. However, when we vary the planet mass, then you notice that the spiral arm starts to deviate from the linear theory, become more open up. And also, another spiral arm shows up at the inner disk and uh, have a like, M equal to mode at the inner disk. So it seems that in the nonlinear picture, the pitch angle increases with the planet mass. And that's because the spiral wave becomes spiral shock. Shock propagates at faster speed than the sound speed. So it propagates faster in the radio direction. So the spiral arm opens up more. 
And also, there is this mystery, a mysterious um, second arm appears, and the separation between these two arms increases with any mass. And the third effect is the amplitude of shocks becomes stronger. So in this nonlinear picture, we could not only use the spiral to estimate the disk temperature, but we could use it to estimate the planet mass. And here is another demonstration that we can use the separation of these two arms to estimate the planet mass. This is from independent work um, from another group. So they measure the separation between these two arms. The planet is somewhere here. And show that the separation of these two arms increases with the planet mass, Q is the planet mass over star, stellar mass. So, so now we could use a spiral arm to estimate the planet mass. And we also studied the 3D structure of the spiral shock. So this is a density perturbation at this mid plane, and this is density perturbation at this atmosphere. So you can see that the surface has much more perturbation than the mid plane. So we could reproduce previous results if we just do 2D simulation, halfway to 3D or assuming very hydrostatic equilibrium, we won't see the spiral arm at all. But if you put the 3D structure directly into point cover to transfer, then we can see the spiral arms. So both of these two difficulties people had before, now it's not a seems not a problem. So we could put everything together and explain this particular source by put a six cubic mass planet at outer disks and explain these two spiral arms. So um, so here we suggest there's a planet at the hundred uh, one hundred AU, a six cubic mass planet, and this model also has a prediction that if these spiral arms will not move much this time. So when I give this talk at the Space Telescope Institute. The experts with the Hubble Space Telescope told me they have reprocessed images, the same source, uh, 10 years ago. And they find the spiral arms do not move much over the 10 years. So this seems to suggest that the, if it's induced by the planets, the planets are altered piece. Because these spiral arms are co-rotating with the planet. So if the planet is at the inner part, as people suggested before, at 30 AU, then over 10 years, the spiral arm will rotate 30 degrees. But if the planet is a 100 AU, as we suggest here, then over 10 years, it will only rotate 3 degrees. It won't be noticeable um, um, between these two images. So um, however, this image is still, uh, the, the quality is very, still very poor. Cool. So this is never really in any paper. So we have a caution, put a caution here. It may be that because the signal is very weak, um, um, there's still the possibility it could be induced by planet and so now we, we have explained these two spiral arms. And this two spiral arm picture is very different from our traditional understanding of planet interaction. Because normally we have seen these pictures uh, many, many times. A planet excites one spiral arm and inner disks. And why now in our simulation we have two spiral arms. And uh, here I'll go into a little bit depth to explain these two spiral arms, uh, just one slide. And actually, when we look at these both simulations in detail, we could kind of see the two spiral arms shows up in the linear region, where you have one spiral arm here, which disappeared later, and then you have the second spiral arm. So now it's good to, uh, goes to a little bit theoretical, um, how to explain the second spiral arm, and it has important implications later. So uh, normally when you do linear analysis, you decompose the uh, potential of the planet into various Fourier modes. And each mode will excite some patterns in the disk. Right? So if you have m equal two mode, it will excite two spiral arm. Then equals one, then equals two, two spiral arm. If you have three m equals three mode, then you have three spiral arm, then equals one, two, three. You have four mode, you have one, two, three, four. And five, the, the five, five, we excite <coughs> one spiral arm. So if you have full, full planet potential, you basically have all these images together. Uh, however, this n equals arm, one arm is always in the same phase in each panel because the planet is here. Always you have this, the first spiral arm goes to the planet. So the n equals one arm mode will always add constructively. So you have peak add to the peak. Eventually, this is the main mechanism for the uh, primary spiral arm, is the coherent construction interference from this n equals one arm. On the other hand, all these arms do not have the perfect phase well, with radius. They have some phase sheets when they propagate inwards. So this n equals one arm will n equals one arm will lose uh, phase coherence when they go into the inner disk. 
But these n equals two arm, which are not in the phase when they are excited, will become coherent. So, so eventually, this n equals two arm in each panel will add constructively um, and form this secondary arm. And furthermore, at the very inner part of the disks, these n equals three modes will add together and form arms. Then you will have the tertiary arm. So this is the theori theoretical explanation for why we have many arms put inside by one planet. And this has important implication is because each arm could open its own gap. So when the spiral arm becomes a shock, then you will transport angular momentum to the disks and open a gap. So when you have one spiral arm, one planet, here is the term of mass planet, you will have the inner primary spiral arm, outer primary spiral arm, you will open two gaps here. But now you have secondary arm generated, and this arm will shock at this distance, then you will open a third gap. So this is where the shock forms by these uh, different arms. So if you plot the potential intensity, which basically trace the shock formation, you can clearly see the spiral wave becomes spiral shock at these positions. The implication is that now we have one planet, but we open three gaps. This is gap is due to the inner primary arm, this is gap due to outer planet arm, this is due to the inner secondary arm. If you increase the planet mass, you can open more gaps just by single planet. That's because the tertiary arm will also become a shock, and then you will open another gap. So in this particular simulation, we only have one planet in the disks, but it opens four gaps. Two gaps close to the planet, and two gaps further away. And this gap is given at 0.35, although the planet is one. So the planet influence is not just where it's close by, um, but it could influence to very, very inner part of the disk. And you don't need multiple planets to open multiple gaps. You could just have one planet. So this is a 2D image for this particular simulation, where we have very low viscosity, where we could allow the secondary arm to become short. So now we have one planet here, and open four gaps, two gaps here, and gap and gap here. And if you look at this image and look at the AMA image, you could see that uh, maybe in this AMA image, we don't really have planets at these gaps. We just have one planet here and open all these gaps. And another thing is all these gap positions, the secondary and tertiary gaps, sensitive depend on the planet mass and the planet of this temperature. So in order to match HO tau observation, which is shown as this red curve here observation, we run simulations and if these gaps are due to a single planet at 70 AU. Uh, due to a planet, the planet mass is around 30 or 60 Earth mass. So now we will use the position of these gaps to estimate the uh, position of these gaps to estimate the mass of the planet. So um, a summary for this part is the a planet can open multiple gaps. You don't need really need multiple planet, and we can use the gap position to estimate the planet mass. Another way to estimate planet mass. And there is a degeneracy with temperature, which you are watching here. And in this particular simulation, uh, we could not really match the depth of the gap. That's because this is a pure gas simulation. But arm observation are probe for dust. So we really need to have dust and gas two fluid simulation. So in a recent work by Robin uh, Dong and his collaborator, uh, he run these two fluid simulation. And he did see that you could open micro gaps uh, with, a, with a single planet. Um, in the, for the dust surface density. And if you do two-hour integration with, um, for, uh, with, with noise considered, um, you could kind of see the gaps. Although in this paper, uh, paper he focused on these gaps close to the planet, but you could kind of see this uh, third gap at the very interface. So this is um, the first part of the talk, that we may be able to use a spiral arm for the gaps to estimate the planet mass. This is what we discussed, and it does matter. It, yes, it matters a lot. So here we have very, very low viscosity. So viscosity is from 10 to negative 4. If you increase the viscosity, you won't see the secondary gap. And that's why most previous simulations don't see it, because uh, viscosity can only do this 10 to negative 4. But if you push the limit, I'm not saying that these gaps have to due to planets, but, uh, but if you push the limit. Estimate of viscosity would be really small. Oh, for, for the HO tau, there is an upper limit on alpha. Uh, for example, uh, for the HO tau, because the rings are so symmetric, uh, and this object is inclined, 
Um, so if the dust layer is puffed up, you will look, the two rings will not be symmetric. Just because, uh, because if when it's open big, uh, these two the rings will not be of uh, the, the, the the surface if it's fair, then the rings will not be perfect symmetric. But because the rings are perfect symmetric, you could estimate the alpha uh, or estimate the turbulent level. The turbulent level, the upper limit is ten to negative three, so it could be lower than ten to negative three. So this is another interesting thing: is HO power is still operating at very high rate, ten to negative six or mass per year, but alpha is very small. It's lower than ten. So we kind of know alpha. Uh, that's by turbulent, uh, and, and it's consistent with that pressure rate. No, it's uh, so that alpha su suggests that uh, um, if it's ten to negative three, it still works because the DC is very massive. But there is no reason the accretion at this scale, one hundred U, is the same as the accretion onto the star. So if you want to adopt this constant accretion feature, uh, constant accretion rate feature, uh, with ten to negative three, still maybe okay. But if you go push a little bit lower, 10 to negative 4 or 5, it's not consistent. But on the other hand, these particles only trace the turbulent level at this midpoint. The this could be totally occurred through the active layer, or through the surface, or by the wind. So there, there is not a big issue if you think that this can have a um, vertical stratified structure and accrete at different rate at different heights. Yeah, so, um, so, so there are a lot of uh, uncertainties. But in order to see this multiple gap, you need very low viscosity. But eventually, we want to probe these young planets uh, because we are saying if there are planets, um, we could argue this forever um, unless we find there are planets. <laughs> so, so how we can find these planets? Uh, first, you would think it's very difficult. Jupiter is very faint, tend to make it nice solar, uh, Jupiter, solar luminosity. On the other hand, for young Jupiter, the situation may be different. Young Jupiter will open a gap in the disks and will gather a tiny disk around Jupiter. So this is circumplanetary disk. And we know the existence of existence of circumplanetary because all the Jupiter's moons lie in the plane. So we know they form it has to form a disk configuration. And if this tiny disk is a pretty, like it's a circumstellar disk, it will be very bright. So for example, if we just assume Jupiter creates at 10 to negative 5 Jupiter mass per year, that means we form a 10 Jupiter mass planet within one million year lifetime. Reasonable number. The accretion luminosity for this tiny disk will be 10 to negative 3 solar luminosity. So it will be as bright as M type brown dwarf. So this tiny disk will outshine the planet and we should be able to detect it. So then I give you some SED calculations for these tiny disks. So this is SED for photo um, planetary disks. And this is, these are the SED from the planets in the disks. And the planets basically follow the black body spectrum because the planet is uh, as one single temperature. And these are the SEDs for circumplanetary disks using a simple disk model. And since it's a, from accretion disks, you have a hot inner part and a cool outer part, so the SED does not follow a black body spectrum. It's much flatter. So the best bet to find circumplanetary disks is actually at the mid infrared, um, where you have much higher contrast between the circumplanetary disks and the protostar. And so far, there are several candidates already. This is one source within this cavity of this uh, transitional disks. It has an L band detection and J band upper limit. If I put it here, it's consistent with this uh, circumplanetary disk feature. And another source with a two detection and L and M band and one upper limit at uh, uh, J band. And again, it's consistent with a creating circumplanetary disk. So maybe we already have some candidates for these tiny disks when uh, they are creating. And the best example so far, uh, of course, the best bet in future is GWST, where it's sensitive to the medium grid, will have much higher contrast. And the best example so far is Luca 15. So this is a transitional disk with 50 AU gap, and there are two sources within this cavity, B and C. And this B source is very red. Uh, both of these sources are very red, consistent with the creating circumplanetary But this B source also has very strong H alpha emission. And H alpha is another creating indicator. So now we have two probes suggesting that this is a Christian disk where it produces both strong and alpha emission and also very red color. So, um, so it seems that the creating certain planets may be the key to find young planets directly. Then the question, the next question we have is why certain planets has to accrete? Maybe it's not accreting. So the certain planets 
may occur because it's turbulent or maybe it launch wind, like circumstances. But we also have ideas from binary systems. Normally in a binary system, when you plan this interaction, you assume a planet is a secondary and the star is primary. As I mentioned in the first part of the talk, the signal will excite a spiral wave in the primary disks, and uh, we may see, have seen it. But if we change our perspective, you think the planet is primary and the star is a secondary, then the star will excite spiral density wave in your circumplanetary disks. And we will really know these spiral shocks could transfer any moment and efficiency. So uh, Larson has a semi-analytic calculation that suggests that this spiral shock can be very efficient to transport angular momentum as long as the temperature is high enough. So the thermodynamics is the key in this whole spiral shock picture. So we want to do a simulation to study whether these uh, tidal spiral shocks would explain the operation of certain planetary disks. But it's very difficult to simulate certain planetary disks. First, you need a large dynamical range. The Jupiter surface is four magnitudes smaller than one AU. And also, you normally use static mesh refinement going all the way to zoom in the sur uh, planet surface. But this introduces green noise because you are trying to simulate a capillary rotation disk with a Cartesian box. And every time you go from a coarse grid to fine grid, you need to do interpolation. So within one orbit, you do eight interpolation, introduce a lot of green noise. So this is my own simulation, which shows you can kind of see the stripes here. So which is the green noise um, due to the static mesh refinement. So due to these numerical issues, previous simulations suggest that the accretion onto the planet is actually not converged. If you double the resolution, the accretion rate decreased by a factor of two. So numerically, this was uh, a difficult problem. So uh, when we look at this problem, we again change our perspective. We centered on our simulation grid onto the planet because the circumplanet disk is what we are interested in. We don't need to center everything on the star. We center on the planet. In this case, we don't need mesh refinement, and all the flows around the planet are in the, uh, are in the direction of the grid. So with this numerical approach, uh, we could um, we maintain a gas structure, and we feed mass in, and we could add thermodynamics uh, here. And what we find is that these spiral shocks can indeed lead to very efficient angular moment transport in certain planet disks. When the temp when the circumplanet is increased at high rate, around 10 million five cube mass per year, the alpha is close to 0.01, and uh, this is because the temperature is high, the spiral arms opens up, and the spiral shock will propagate to the inner disk. Alpha is large. Now, when the circumplanet is increased at low rate, around 10 million nine cube mass per year, then the temperature is low, then the spiral arm are more tightly wound. The spiral shock cannot really penetrate very deep, and alpha is a little bit lower. But nevertheless. Uh, no matter the rate is high or low, we have an uh, alpha value of 1 to negative 3 to 10 to negative 2. So the bottom line is the spiral shocks in these first principle simulations could give a reasonable alpha. We don't need to rely on MR turbulence or some hyper turbulence or wind. Just by the spiral shock, the circumplanet is to the grid. And, and when we know the alpha value, um, every disk property is determined. So then we can test, for example, a satellite form. So there are two models for the uh, satellite formation. The first model is called the minimal mass subnebular model. Basically, it is the brother of the minimal mass subnebular model. You spread all the mass in the moon to a disk. And uh, this disk has a peculiar amount of mass, around 10 to 6 gram per centimeter squared, um, in, for this particular model. Another model is the evolving gas model, gas star of this model by Kenneth Ward. In this model, um, you have gas feeding from certain stellar disks to certain planet disks, and the planet, uh, the dust can grow, and when it grow big enough, they are left in the disk while the gas increases to the planet. So in this case, the solids are kept in the disk, and the gas flows through. In this model, the gas surface density is orders of magnitude smaller than this minimum mass subnebular model. So these two models have dramatically different gas surface density. So for our simulations, it seems that our, our simulation favors this gas star satellite formation model, where the disk surface density is order of magnitude smaller than the minimum mass of the model. So from the first principle of simulations, maybe we already could constrain uh, how our satellites form in our solar system. 
Another thing is, if we know everything about the disks, we can make prediction on uh, how bright these sources are at sub-millimeter. And I'll talk about this in more in the lunch uh, time. So it seems that with our simulation, all the three candidates previously are observable with ARMA. So we are still waiting for the ARMA observation for these three near-infrared sources to confirm they are there uh, in full practice. If they are confirmed, that will be very exciting. That will be the first time we see circumpendular disks in circumpendular disks. So the circumpendular disks are summarized here. Um, uh, the creating circumpendular disks should be very bright. Um, maybe that's the key to probe planets in circumstellar disks. And we have some candidates already. And the spiral shocks induced by the star can it's very efficient angular momentum transport and give constraints on satellite formation. But there is a caveat. If 3D simulations are still needed, um, because it should, previous simulations have shown that the flow structure is not really 2D in circumstellar disk, material could fall from the, from the gap to the circumstellar disk directly. So in future, we will do 3D simulations. So the final part of my talk, maybe another uh, five minutes, I'll talk about our recent effort to construct a global simulation for photo primary disks. And we want to solve this problem, whether how circumstellar is accrete, whether it's turbulent, or it's due to laminar uh, wind. And in this particular talk, I'll just focus on the very inner part of the disk, where the disk is in ideal image limit, so things are a lot uh, uh, simpler. But this is our first step to extend to non-ideal image limit. So what drives accretion? So if you are familiar with accretion the theory, um, there are two ways to drive accretion in disks. One is by the turbulence. Normally, it's we think by MRI turbulence, that will lead to stress within the disk, transport angular momentum. And another way to transport angular momentum is by these large-scale magnetic fields exert a torque at the deep surface and launch a wind, so you have a stress at the surface. So both ways to lead to accretion. And both things depends on the field strength you put, you put there. So if you have stronger net vertical field, MRI is stronger. If you have stronger field, the wind is stronger. So you don't know which one dominates. And since everything here depends on the net vertical field, um, you, you will also worry about how the magnetic field will transport in these disks. And if you could quickly lose all the field, then all of these will not be applicable to polyplanet disks. And we know the field transport um, equation can be derived from the induction equation. And you have a advection term and a diffuse term. And normally, um, if the parental number is equals one, which means the viscosity equal resistivity, then the diffusion will be faster, this one, will be faster than the advection by R over H. So that means if you thread it with the disk with a net vertical field, the disk will quickly lose all the magnetic fields. So there won't be turbulence and there won't be wind. So that was the problem. So in order to study these, we want to carry a simulation with very high resolution so we could capture both turbulence MRI turbulence. And we want the simulation cover large domain so we can get the wind to calculate the stress at surface. And to study the field transport, we want a code which could conserve magnetic field. We don't want to immediately lose magnetic field in the micro simulation. So uh, we did this new simulation with Athena Plus Plus. So this new simulation uh, has two new features. The first is mesh refinement. So we have very high resolution at this mid-plane, so we could capture MRI turbulence. And we have also coarse grid at atmosphere, so our numerical time step will not be limited by the high uh, often speed here. And also, for the first time, we include the pole region. So we have a special boundary at the pole, so we do not allow magnetic fields to lose at the pole. Normally, when you do this simulation, you cut a, you cut a, pole, or cut a hole at the pole for the uh, coordinate singularity, then you don't lose magnetic fields. In these simulations, we have spatial boundaries, so we will not lose magnetic field. So we thread this with different magnetic fields, field, and we use logarithmic spacing for three order magnitude. And then we thermodynamics is still simple here, as a local isothermal. And uh, uh, here is a test. It's a field loop test. You have a field loop in the disk, and you affect it in the disk to see whether you will conserve the shape or strength of the field. So it seems that the field loop here passed successfully through this boundary from the mesh to coarse grid, and then passed through the pole, and then go to the other side. Okay. 
So basically, this is a code test to show that our simulation could, con could conserve magnetic field in the simulation. So this is a real simulation after burning medium CPU hours generate a lot of heat for global warming. <laughs> so um, this is uh, shows shows the IBM HD simulation with uh, deflated by um, very weak magnetic field 10 to, 10 to 3 beta IP plane. And after running for 1,000 or 2,000 innermost orbit, and has very high resolution at the mid plane to capture MHD um, turbulence. And it also capture the wind. So here is the movie showing that this is highly turbulent. So if we imagine this is the inner part of the planet disk, or this is like the disk of FU orbit systems, and you could kind of see the wind uh, launched uh, in this disk. So after running this simulation, we can do analysis. For example, we could add smoothly average the density and plot uh, the, the velocity streamlines. So in this particular simulation, we have the traditionally turbulent mid-plane layer, and we have the wind region. But there is a sur surprising finding in this particular simulation, is we have this extended region. And this extended region has very fast inflow velocity. It's supersonic. So at the surface of this, the flow flow almost supersonically to some speed inwards, and then you have launch wind at upper layer. So this new region, Corona region, actually has been seen in some black hole simulations before, but it has not drawn a lot, a lot of attention. Most of the study focus on turbulence and wind, and this region is kind of, uh, does not uh, draw a lot of attention. And if we make a cut at R equals one, and we see that here is the mid plane, and this is new region, the Corona region, and this Corona region has a velocity two times the sound speed. So this actually, uh, corona reading has been predicted from the previous analytic calculations. And people have found this if you add everything still consistently. Analytically, you should also see this fast supersonic corona region. And uh, if you look at the mass transport rate, however, the mid plane actually mass flowing out. So in this new picture, even in ideal imagery, uh, you have uh, this structure where mass moving out that mid plane and forcing at the surface. This is very different from our traditional understanding of a cushion disk. Everything goes through the mid plane. But now, in this self consistent simulation, you have this meridian circulation. People call it 2D viscous disks. But it's due to different reasons. Here is due to mag mag magnetic field. So we could also analyze the mass loss rate or cushion rate. So we could rewrite the angular momentum separate into various terms, mass equation rate term and various stress terms. So, so we have a lot of plots. If we just focus on this one, so this shows that the mass equation rate, mass equation rate is, is maintained by the R5 stress. And if you do the, um, i skip the, the numbers here. But it seems that most of equation is through this corona region, and R5 is extremely large, from 1 to 5 to 1. And only 5% of accretion is actually due to this wind. So this wind is not important when you have MHD turbulence. It's very weak. And the wind loss rate is very low. The wind loss rate is only 0.4% of the accretion rate. So the disk will not lose a lot of mass in that MHD um, So apparently this is inconsistent with Fiori's observations. I did my thesis on Fiori. And I know the Fiori outflow rate is 10% of the accretion rate. So right now we are carrying out radiation MHD simulations with EFA uh, because radiation is very important in FURI systems. And preliminary, pre preliminary results suggest in FURI systems, if you consider thermodynamics properly, that this will be very tough. Uh, the wind loss rate will be a lot higher than we could match FURI observations. Okay, so um, so I'll skip this uh, mechanism. Uh, and a comment on how to maintain the level of field. So normally we think if the Prandtl number is equal to 1, the diffusion is larger than advection by RH. So the disk will quickly lose magnetic field. Uh, I think the same thing could also be true in black hole disks. Uh, but why does our simulation maintain this global field? And that's actually because this corona region. First, your first corona region increases this advection term. And then this corona region extends very high, so around the over edge. So now the scale height here for magnetic field is not the disk scale height but R. So diffusion and abaction balanced in this new feature. 
So I'll summarize here. Um, so first I talk about indirect signatures of planets. We can use the spirals or maybe use the gap to estimate the planet mass. Um, and eventually, um, we want to find planets directly and uh, argue certain planets may be very important. And these things which we have not paid much attention and they should be observable and they could actually there is a reason for them to accrete due to the spiral short um, driving them. And eventually we want to do global simulations including everything and eventually from uh, this thing to the campus. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, so so we talk about, in our recent paper with Sean, we talk about the detectability of certain planets, uh, jet from certain planets. So we basically scale the jet from AGN, protostar, <laughs> make a line, and draw the certain planets. So I don't know how that could differ by three or many. But there is nothing in the image. Uh, so, so, that, so it suggests that uh, maybe with the uh, next generation VOA, we will see the free free emission. But uh, so far, we don't have that yet um, emission from certain planets. So earlier in the talk, you said that the uh, spiral structure depended on the temperature and the yeah. disk, and then there was a discrepancy between one example that you have with 300 yeah. Kelvin right. required for the structure right. and 50 Kelvin for yeah. the CO lines. Right. Wouldn't this be a way to determine the uh, level of turbulence in the disk? Yeah, uh, so actually, the you mean the turbine heat the disk? Well, yeah, the the, for example, in like a cloud, the, the CL lines are typically 10 Kelvin, but owing to the turbulence, oh, the yeah, turbulence is 1 or 2,000 yeah, yeah. Kelvin. So yeah. wouldn't the turbulence play a similar role in the disk? Yeah, yeah. so turbine broadening in protoband disk actually will be, um, has not been measured. So people try very hard to measure the turbine right. for broadening. The they want to get the break. Yeah, they want to it's get the turbulence. Yeah. But so far, um, from all the molecular line observation, there is no turbulence in the like this. Even at atmosphere, where you uh, measure the huge uh, cap, it is a very precise time observation and measure the line with trying to get the turbulent velocity. But so far, it's inconsistent with there's no turbulence. I think the upper limit is even less than 10% sun speed. So, just for reference, you have a standard alpha viscosity accretion disk, and you can compute a spectrum from that. Uh, yeah. And this coronal accretion model, is this yes. look any different than a standard? Yeah, indeed. So, the coron we haven't done the NH analysis for corona because we used simple thermodynamics, and now when we do radiation image dissimulation, now we are really doing the thermodynamics budget uh, correctly. And so far, the results suggest that we cannot really use the traditional alpha model because the corona equation, it does not dissipate energy. So you, it's not turbulent at the corona region. It's just a global field geometry, and the global field carry angular away. So we cannot really use a single alpha model to estimate the, the brightness and the really real equation rate. So the alpha for the energy dissipation can be very small, uh, even though the diesel is very fast. Yeah. So that's a peculiar thing about these, uh, these new equation 3D simulations. Uh, I noticed so your supercomplementary accretion disk is very hot. Uh, yes. Over a thousand Kelvin or something. Yeah. So and many of these moons are ice rich. Are there right. just were formed with ice? Right. How water right. and volatiles? Right. When do your moons form? Yeah. So 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 here I think the picture is uh, even in this gas star satellite formation model, they were at a phase where the diesel increased at much lower rate. Okay, so it's sort of tail. Yes, at a tail. So maybe when the gaseous disk is already going away. Like everything, the accretion rate always dropped. So at the earlier phase, you have hot things, you cannot form moon, or maybe moon form, but they migrate to the planet. And while what we are left with uh, in our solar system is that tail of this accretion disk when everything is very cool, you, you how, form. The, how long is that tail? Like what, what's your time limit to form those moons? So, <laughs> so uh, yeah, so that's on the, uh, yeah, that's for the people studying the moons. I, I, yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I think, in those models, um, 
gas and star this model the moons have to very quickly because the planetesimal was magically formed and then they put things together. So very hand wavy. Just a simple question for some reason, the exterior, I didn't know anything about spiral structure and profile of three disks. The lens of the you know, red light spiral structure of galaxies. Yeah. Well, I mean, is the physics of it, like in galaxies focused on bright people doing things perturbers, uh, perturbing the jet and right. design by spirals? Is the physics of what you're describing yeah. very similar or is it very different? Is it basically the same or is it very different? Yeah, so, so actually, the, the reason we think there is a planet at the two out of the spiral arm was come, the idea comes from the galaxy because the, there is this galaxy M81. You have satellite galaxy as two spiral arm. And I want to take that image, it looks exactly like this. So that maybe there's a planet outside. But the <laughs> physics, so, so the physics is different though, because uh, normally the satellite galaxy you only have one orbit, the time, time scale. So it's more like an encounter event. But in this polar planet, you have hundreds of orbits. So the physics could be a little bit different. Uh, so the potential is Yeah, the potential is Yeah, the potential is more different. So all of the image looks identical. I also have a question about these images. What did you imagine if there are two giant planets? Do you think there are different orbital phase may suppress some of the Yeah. Spirals? Yeah, so one thing uh, I, I want to, maybe it's worth mentioning. Uh, there are actually more than two spiral arms in some recent observations on this, uh, on this particular source. So the recent observation, Suggest there are they have detected three spiral arms <laughs> uh, in this particular source. So they argue there are uh, one source inside and one source outside. Um, so and they interfere with each other. Um, so things are get some messier when you have better observation. Always you have new things. <laughs> so if there are no more quest uh, questions, let's thank our speaker again. <laughs> this afternoon so please let me know if you'd like to join us and he also has some slots open on Friday so please feel free to sign up on the wiki page to meet with you. Thank you.
It's gas yeah, it's always yeah, but it's always in the star. Yeah, 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 it's always in the star in a circle orbit. Yes, yes. Oh, it's also in the star. Yeah, it's always 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 in the